you that do know me, I'm also Richard Pye. I'm the 14th clerk of the Australian Senate. It's the only joke I'm going to do today, you'll be pleased to know. Um, today's is the sixth lecture given in honour of the late Harry Evans, the 12th clerk of the Senate and our longest serving clerk who held the role from 1988 to 2009, capping off over 40 years in service to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Harry's family um, who have joined us today. Welcome back. Um, and I also welcome my predecessor, Dr. Rosemary Lang, who established this lecture series. Uh, these lectures examine matters championed by Harry during his tenure as clerk, including the importance of the Senate as an institution, the rights of individual senators, and the value of parliamentary democracy the place of the Senate as the linchpin of Australia's Federation is also something that we examine. Uh, like so many other things, the Harry Evans lecture series has been in interrupted in recent years, and it's a great pleasure to be able to resume the series today. Um, our lecture is being live streamed on the Australian Parliament website. It's also being Auslan interpreted and captioned. I warmly welcome you all, whether you're attending in person or online. Our lecturer today is Professor Anne Toomey AO. Professor Toomey is an Australian academic and lawyer spe specialising in Australian constitutional law. She's currently the Professor of Constitutional Law and Director of the Constitutional Law Reform Unit at the University of Sydney. She writes and comments in the media on a range of constitutional issues, including federalism, parliament, electoral law, executive power, and the reserve powers of the Crown. She's much sought out in these roles because of the depth of her ex expertise and the clarity of her communication. In earlier times, Professor Toomey worked as secretary to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Always have to get that, uh, get that role in, in our biographies here. Um, and also in senior research roles in the High Court of Australia and the um, Australian Parliamentary Library. She's also worked in the New South Wales Cabinet Office and has acted as a consultant to numerous government bodies. Her talk today addresses recently vexing questions about freedom of movement in Australia. Law and border, who has the power to control movement across state borders? Please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Toomey. Thank you so much. It's such an honour to be here because Harry Evans was um, to me, um, a mentor and an inspiration. He was a legend in this place. And he and Rosemary Lang uh, were people who gave me so much time and uh, support in my younger years when I was really just learning the ropes and parliament and how it works and all the rest of it. So uh, it is a great honor to be able to speak um, at a lecture dedicated to um, someone as wonderful as Harry. Now, when the COVID, uh, oh, I should say one more thing before I start. You might see there's a PowerPoint thing up here. This is not going to be death by PowerPoint. Uh, let me tell you that the PowerPoint is here for the purpose of showing you pictures. Okay, no words, just pictures. So um, today I'm going to speak, as you know, about law and border. So when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, some states, as we're all aware, closed their borders in an attempt to prevent the disease from spreading to their state. Now, this led to a political and a constitutional dispute. Section 92 of the Constitution says that trade, commerce and intercourse among the states shall be absolutely free. Now, in this context, intercourse among the states doesn't mean what you might think, but it means just the movement of people or goods or animals across state borders. So it effectively, therefore, is a guarantee of free movement throughout Australia across the various states. So was the Constitution breached when the states closed their borders during COVID? And could the Commonwealth Parliament have done anything to override their actions. So that's what I'm going to be addressing today. Now, the first question about the states and whether or not they breached the constitution involves confronting the question about what is meant in the constitution by the words absolutely free. Can any restrictions be placed on freedom of movement amongst the states? Now, in considering that question, 
It's helpful to look at both the intent of the framers of the Constitution, but also to read the text of the Constitution to see Section 92 in the context of the rest of it. Now, it's plain from the text of the Constitution that some restrictions are permitted. The Commonwealth Parliament was given power to regulate interstate trade and commerce under Section 51.1 and quarantine under Section 51.9. Section 112 of the Constitution recognises that states may levy charges for the inspection of goods or animals as they cross state borders. And none of this could happen if absolutely free meant absolutely free. So it's clear from the text of the Constitution that in writing it, there was an intention that Section 92 meant something less than um, absolutely free. Now, this is consistent with the original intent of the Constitution as expressed by various framers over time. Uh, Samuel Griffith, for example, considered that Section 92 was really directed at freedom from taxes, charges and imposts at the state border. So it was about stopping one state putting taxes on goods as they came across the border and being protectionist. Uh, when John Coburn and Henry Higgins in the 1890s constitutional conventions raised the fear that this Section 92 might prevent their states from excluding diseased animals from entering the state, their concerns were dismissed. Richard O'Connor, um, also up there, observed that the states would retain a right of self-protection so that they could prohibit diseased persons and animals from entering the state without breaching the freedom of trade, commerce and human intercourse. Now O'Connor, as we know, later became one of the first judges of the High Court. Alfred Deakin, writing um, as Attorney General in 1902, accepted that interstate freedom of trade is not infringed by a law prohibiting the introduction of diseased animals and that state legislative powers also extend to quarantine and reasonable inspection laws. Now, Patrick Glynn, who was another of the framers of the Constitution, writing a little bit later as Attorney General in 1909, advised that a state inspection law would be unconstitutional if it imposed an unnecessary or unreasonable burden upon interstate commerce. He considered that a law that imposed a complete prohibition upon certain kinds of plants being brought into a state, healthy and diseased alike, imposes an unnecessary burden on interstate commerce and cannot be justified on the ground that it's a um, precautionary measure against the introduction of disease. Some of this may ring quite a bell with you in relation to things happening recently, but this is from 1909. Um, so if the law were conditional, however, uh, rather than absolute, and if the conditions were, re were neither unreasonable nor greater than reasonably necessary to meet the ostensible purpose, then he thought the law would be valid. Now, it's really quite interesting if you look at that, because that's very, very similar to what the High Court later says in the Palmer case. So there is a consistency from 1909 all the way up to um, 2021. Okay, so as a consequence of all that, it's unsurprising that the High Court did take um, the same sort of approach. So there's a case called Ex parte Nelson, uh, and in that case, Chief Justice Knox, um, Justices Gavin Duffy and S Justice Stark um, in 1928 said this, the establishment of freedom of trade between the states is perhaps the most notable achievement of the Constitution. Yet it would be a strange result if that achievement had stripped the states of power to protect their citizens from the dangers of infectious and contagious diseases, however such dangers may arise. Their honours concluded that a New South Wales law that prohibited diseased cattle from crossing the border into New South Wales, and which required for some of the cattle to be um, killed to prevent the, the spread of disease, um, did not breach Section 92 of the Constitution. And in 1935, the court took a similar view in relation to diseased potatoes. 
Um, you'll note, by the way, that I'm not leaving up the diseased potatoes um, slide for very long because it is rather distasteful. But anyway, um, now this one's quite interesting because here, a law that banned diseased potatoes from entering the state uh, was held valid, but sorry, it was to be valid, but a law that banned all potatoes without checking them just to exclude the risk of disease was considered to be invalid because it was disproportionate. And so here we see again this notion of proportionality coming into play in the High Court's jurisprudence. Okay, that gets us through all the technical legal stuff until we get to the end. So let's talk a bit more about what actually happens um, in some practical examples in relation to border closures. So we know about diseased cattle and potatoes, but what about people? Don't people have greater rights to cross um, state borders? Can a state shut its borders to prevent people from crossing the borders if they may be um, carrying a contagious disease? Now, this dilemma first faced the Australian states, um, not in um, 2020, but back in 1919 during the time of Spanish flu. When the Spanish flu began to spread um, in 1918 in Europe and elsewhere, Australia had two levels of protection. The first level was the external border of Australia, so present, preventing it coming into the country altogether. And the second layer of protection was the borders between the states. Soldiers returning home from war were quarantined on their ships in Sydney Harbour or at the North Head Quarantine Station. Now, on one occasion, there was insufficient accommodation at the North Head Quarantine Station and the troops were desperate to get off the ship. So they were told to come on um, to the land near the quarantine station at North Head and set up camps and um, tents and serve their quarantine there. What they hadn't accounted for was the snakes. On the very first night that they camped out there, the soldiers killed 67 poisonous snakes. They didn't get much sleep. In the morning, the soldiers decided to um, revolt. So what they did was in formation, uh, they, and fully masked to protect the public, they then... Um, don't know that I have that picture. No, anyway, sorry. Fully mass, uh, they went and um, marched to the gates of the quarantine centre, dared the guards on the gates to shoot them. Um, unsurprisingly, the guards on the gates were not prepared to shoot Australian soldiers who were hardened soldiers who just returned from World War I, so they were let out. They marched all the way down to, um, to the wharf at Manly, took a ferry into the city, and after some deal of negotiation, uh, were taken off to the Sydney cricket ground where they served the rest of their quarantine without the snakes. Okay, so that's the first story about what happened. But the second line of protection was, well, once disease had entered um, into Australia, there needed to be some way of stopping it spreading throughout the country. So before um, disease got to Australia, there was an intergovernmental agreement, and this was formed in November 1918. And the agreement um, was that at the first sign that um, Spanish flu had entered into a state, the state then had to notify the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth would then take control over the state's borders, closing the borders to the neighbouring states and only reopening them when the neighbouring state was infected too. So, you know, once your border control was, you know, ineffective, then of course you reopened. Now, Victoria became the first state to be infected, but it didn't admit it. And it was only when a doctor blew the whistle because he was getting a lot of people coming to him with serious flu symptoms that eventually Victoria admitted that yes, Spanish flu had entered the state. But by that time, someone from Victoria had brought it into New South Wales. Well, New South Wales was absolutely livid and slammed its border shut with Victoria and declared the intergovernmental um, agreement was at an end. And from that point, it was every state for itself. They all went and opened and shut their borders according to what they thought were in the best interests of their own community and the whole intergovernmental agreement uh, went straight out the window. Um, the Commonwealth 
tried to reassert control, but its threats were simply ignored. Uh, the states just acted in the interests of their people. Now, Western Australia went further. Uh, it seized and impounded the transcontinental train as it entered Western Australia and placed all the people on the train in quarantine. Now, the Commonwealth objected and said, well, this is a breach of our intergovernmental agreement of November 1918, and it's possibly also a breach of the Constitution. And the Western Australians said, we don't care. Uh, and this is how the Perth Daily News explained it. It said, had we admitted the transcontinental travellers, we might have suffered infection. There was a chance. We preferred to flout authority, break the agreement of November, and perhaps even fracture some constitutional statute rather than court the disaster of the entrance within our border of the Black Plague, as they described it. So you can see the attitude in Western Australia again may have something familiar about it. Uh, now, while Spanish flu actually did um, eventually penetrate um, the... St oh, sorry, I've got to tell you one more little thing about that. So when the Western Australians slammed the border shut, the Premier, Henry Lefroy, found himself on the wrong side of the border. <laughs> he was struck, stuck in Melbourne, where he'd been attending a Premier's conference. It was the acting Western Australian Premier, Hal Colbatch, who shut the border and then resisted the pleas of his own Premier <laughs> to let him back in, and the Prime Minister, who was insisting it should be opened as well. Now, the thing is, Colbatch's action in shutting the border was wildly popular, so much so that eventually Colbatch himself became Premier, despite being a member of the Upper House, which is quite interesting. Uh, for various reasons, he didn't last that long as Premier, but you can see the whole thing about it being very popular to close the Western Australian border. So while Spanish flu did eventually penetrate the state, um, the delay of the entry of Spanish flu into Western Australia undoubtedly saved many lives. Uh, Queensland also shut its borders, uh, including those to people on the borders, so the border communities were affected. Uh, it charged people a considerable amount of money to enter quarantine camps, uh, and it required people to receive two compulsory vaccinations before they were allowed to enter the state. Uh, there were all too familiar stories uh, of lockdowns, the closure of schools, disagreements about mask wearing, vaccine mandates and quack cures. Everything that happened 100 years later happened back then. Uh, it is astonishing once you start reading the newspapers and entries of the time uh, how we all reverted to doing exactly the same things. Uh, but despite all the controversy, no one actually initiated a constitutional challenge uh, to the border closures. Okay, this now brings us to war, which was the next reason for border closures. During World War II, the Commonwealth issued a, an order under its national security laws that prohibited civilians from traveling by train from one state to another across the border unless the civilian had a permit. Now, according to the official version of events, and I'll get to the unofficial version soon, but according to the official version, Dulcie Johnson was a young woman who was engaged to be married. She was in love. Her fiance was in the Navy. He was stationed in Perth and he was about to leave to go to war. Dulcie was in Sydney, desperate to see her beloved one last time before he went off to war because she might never see him again. So what does Dulcie do? She applies for a permit to travel on the train to Perth um, in order to see him and it's not a good enough reason and she is refused. But Dulcie was persistent. So what did she do? Well, she got tickets from one point to another point, And so she managed to get herself all the way up to um, the, the border with South Australia. And then she managed to get you know, on the, the train there further. And eventually she got all the way to Port Augusta. Um, uh, and um, uh, that was as far as a ticket went in South Australia. They weren't gonna let it go on to Western Australia, but she stayed on the train and she admitted to the conductor of the train that she had no ticket to cross the border into Western Australia. And the conductor said, well, I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to get off in Cook, uh, which was the last place before the border with Western Australia. 
But when the train pulled up in Cook, the um, station master in Cook said she wasn't allowed to get off the train because Cook was no place for a young lady. So Dulcie stayed on the train, made it to Perth and was prosecuted. Um, so she got very good legal counsel and her counsel argued that the law breached section 92 of the constitution. The magistrate was convinced and the charge was dismissed. Now, the media portrayed this all as a great love story. So there were many articles in the newspapers about it. Um, Dulcie was described in the press as blonde and remarkably beautiful. Love laughed at rail permits, cried one newspaper. Now, the Commonwealth appealed the case because obviously it didn't want people to think that its um, laws were invalid and um, appealed up to the High Court. Uh, Dulcie ended up being represented in the High Court by two of the most illustrious counsel of the time, one of whom was Garfield Barwick. Uh, how did this young woman pay for her counsel? Well, she didn't. Um, who was paying for them? Well, actually the airlines, because the airlines wanted to run a Section 92 case and thought that a far more sympathetic person was the young and beautiful Dulcie, so they chipped in and paid for counsel to um, run her appeal. Um, uh, so that's where the story ended until one year when I was teaching this and mused to myself, I wonder whatever happened to Dulcie? Did her man come home? Did she get married, have a happy life? I don't know. So one of my students, Claire Davidson, decided to do a bit more research into Dulcie to find out what happened. And in looking at Dulcie's story, she discovered that there was a remarkably beautiful young blonde woman who used the alias of Dulcie Johnson, amongst others. Uh, and she was known also in the press as the Angel of Death and the Black Widow. This Dulcie Johnson was a notorious Sydney underworld figure. According to the press, at least eight of her husbands or lovers had been gunned down or stabbed to death, and she had more than 100 convictions. Now, what we do know is this Dulcie did actually travel to Perth from her east coast dens of crime because we know she was convicted of running a brothel um, in 1946. Um, and you see the newspaper clipping there, you probably can't read it, but they refer to her as Pretty Dulcie. Um, under one of her other um, names, she used a number of um, pseudonyms, but um, Dulcie was always included in them. Okay, so was she the same Dulcie Johnson who had no permit to travel to Perth uh, in October 1944? Now, being the good academic I am, the first thing I did was decide to scour the archival files to see if I could find some kind of answer to this. Um, uh, and so that's what I did. Well, the one thing I did find out was there were two red flags in those files. The first was that the records state that proof of Dulcie's identity was waived. Uh, and this is stated a number of times in the record, so no one actually required her to provide any proof as to what her name was, etc., etc. They just went on the basis of what she told them, and that's recorded in the files. Struck me as a little bit odd. Second thing was that in Dulcie's interview, she actually named her beloved who was in the Navy and serving at a particular base. Now, I've now looked at all the war records, um, and there are records of everybody who served in the Navy, and he's not there. Um, so the great love story, regardless of who Dulcie was, appears to have been a ruse. Um, so was Dulcie instead the gangland figure fleeing her crimes in Sydney to run a brothel in Perth and then getting the most eminent King's Counsel in the country to represent her for free in the High Court? It's a good story if it's true. I can't say whether or not it is. The, re the reality is we don't know for sure, but it may well be that the Dulcie story is a trifle more interesting than we thought. Okay. Coming back to the law, what about the law? Well, the High Court accepted that transport is intimately connected with defence and that the defence power would support a law restricting transport. But this was still subject to Section 92 of the Constitution. If the law had been one that regulated train travel for defence purposes, 
affecting both intrastate and interstate travel, it could have been valid. But here, there was no defence justification given for restricting only interstate train travel, but not intrastate train travel, and therefore the order was held invalid. Now, in my research on all of this, and Gratwick and Johnson, I found other files where the, the Commonwealth Government made later submissions um, about why they thought the High Court got it wrong in Gratwick and Johnson. And the Commonwealth said that priority obviously needs to be given to military personnel and freight in long-haul train transport during the war. And it said that the law was not actually directed at stopping people from crossing the border per se, uh, because people could still cross the border by other means. It was only train travel that was restricted. You could go across in some other kind of vehicle or walk across it, ride your bicycle or whatever. That wasn't what was prohibited. What was prohibited was long haul transport on trains for reasons of needing the trains. And the obvious place at which to police this was simply the state borders, because that's where there was facility to do so. But in any event, they hadn't managed to convince the High Court and it was too late to argue that. Now, let me give you one other example, which I think is quite interesting. What if a state law marked a line within the state that could not be crossed, um, which then had a consequence that anyone who was above or below that line was then not able to cross the line to get to a border to be able to cross into another jurisdiction? Now, this is what did happen in Western Australia with what became known as the Leper Line, which is the 20th parallel, which you may not be able to see very well there, but um, for anyone watching, it's that one there. Okay, so it's that line over yonder. Sorry if I've moved out of camera shot to show that. Um, so, uh, what happened was that there was um, the spread of leprosy um, in Aboriginal communities in the north of, of the country. And during World War II, because there had been a um, pullback on things like health patrols, etc., that leprosy began to spread. And in 1941, a law was enacted to prohibit Aboriginal people who didn't have a permit from crossing from north to south over that 20th parallel, which was about where Port Hedland is. And it was known colloquially as the leper line. Now, the line had the effect of separating Aboriginal communities and preventing those in the north from being able to travel to the south. And in the north, there were much poorer working conditions, so they couldn't travel to the south to get a better job with better pay, etc. Uh, now, just a warning here, if there are any Aboriginal people watching, I'm about to show a, a, a photo of a, an Aboriginal man who's now deceased. So um, if anyone doesn't want to look at that, um, avert your eyes now. Uh, so in 1957, an Aboriginal man called Dooley Bin Bin transported 17 Aboriginal people from stations north of the line uh, to places south of the line. And one of those people had leprosy. Now, Dooley, who was described in court documents as a native lawgiver, was prosecuted, convicted, and fined one pound by the magistrate uh, with costs of 32 pounds. So you can see where the, the, the costs are much greater than the fine. Anyway. Dooley was represented by a former politician, um, Thomas Hughes, who argued that the law was invalid because it breached section 92 of the constitution, because it prevented Aboriginal people in the north from traveling to the south of Western Australia in order then to travel interstate into South Australia. Uh, the magistrate rejected the argument and it then went to the full court of the Western Australian Supreme Court. And there, Hughes again argued his constitutional case. Um, rather provocatively, he told the court that Dooley, as a tribal law carrier, had the equivalent status as a Supreme Court judge and was therefore a brother-in-law of the bench. Not sure how well that went down, but anyway, the court was not sympathetic to the constitutional arguments that were made. Chief Justice Dwyer, with whom the rest of the court agreed, found that the law was a reasonable measure to prevent the spread of disease. It prevented movement of people within a state so that those south of the line would not be exposed to leprosy. He noted that it had not been suggested that Mr Dooley or any of the other people who were seeking to cross the line intended to travel interstate uh, and had been prevented from doing so and said the law had no real effect on intercourse amongst the states at all, 
Uh, he characterised the law as an exercise of health powers uh, that could, be seen, could not be seen as an attempt to evade Section 92 of the Constitution. Um, and that extent, he's probably right. I don't think the leper line was there for the purposes of stopping people from travelling into state. Uh, and it clearly did have a health purpose, but nonetheless, it did have other ramifications for Aboriginal people who couldn't move to jobs um, south of the line that would give them better um, terms and conditions of employment. Now, Dewey lost his appeal, but he still won the war. How? Well, he arranged for uh, Aboriginal people to cross north and south of the line in such large numbers and on so many occasions that it became impossible for the authorities to um, arrest them all or police it or deal with it at all. The Native Welfare Department then concluded that the law was not really for welfare and said it was a waste of their time trying to give, uh, enforce it. And it then tried to get the health department to overturn it. The health department said, no, we don't want it overturned because it actually really is important. Uh, and in the end, the problem was resolved by just giving people permits when they asked for it. Um, so that was the story of the leper line. So last part of this story is to get to COVID-19. So that history gives us a good context for what happened when the pandemic hit Australia in 2020. Just as in 1919, the states were prepared to close their borders to prevent the spread of a deadly disease, at least before there were vaccinations um, available to limit its serious effects and to then prevent hospitals by being overwhelmed by large numbers of people who were um, affected. Tasmanian's Mercury newspaper gave me its favourite headline um, ever. Uh, which is, we've got a moat and we're, we're prepared to use it. Oh, sorry, we're not afraid to use it. I don't know that I'd call Bass Strait a moat, um, but, you know, it really gives you the impression as to what is meant. Uh, Western Australia, as it did in 1919, shut its border to keep COVID out and was, again, largely successful in doing so. I mean, the advantages of Tasmania and Western Australia is that it is easier to cut yourself off from the rest of the country. Uh, the border closure protected the mining industry in Western Australia. That actually was really important for Australia's economy. Uh, so we did manage to keep up all our exports. Um, if we hadn't managed that, um, the economic crisis and problems we have now would have been infinitely worse. Um, and Western Australia's border closure was also really important to protect a number of very vulnerable Aboriginal communities. So um, there were economic and um, human uh, reasons for doing it, um, as well as the more general, um, slightly more parochial reasons of um, acting in the interests of your own um, communities. Uh, so this brings us to the Palmer case. Um, so the Western Australia border closure, again, was wildly popular but within Western Australia, but was criticised by the Commonwealth and challenged, as we know, in the High Court by Clive Palmer, who was refused entry to the state. Now, Palmer claimed that his physical presence, presence was needed in Western Australia to run his business there. Uh, Western Australia responded by saying, just use Zoom like everybody else. Uh, the parties themselves could not reach an agreement as to the facts in relation to the level of risk involved, and this aspect of the case was then sent off by the High Court to the Federal Court to Justice Rangia. Now, Justice Rangia heard evidence from epidemiologists about the level of risk involved um, in the spread of COVID-19 and in relation to different measures to prevent its entry into the state. He determined that a precautionary approach should be taken to protect the community. The state's capacity to provide safe quarantine facilities was limited and um, the risk of spreading, uh, the disease spreading was high and with potential catastrophic results. Just because for all of us, our memories all start to sort of, you know, merge, this was all happening before we got vaccinations. Um, so the risks were considerably higher in terms of um, health issues as well as um, spread. Uh, so on the basis of Justice Rangia's findings, uh, it could be concluded that the border closure was reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieving the legitimate end of protecting public health. 
Unlike the case about the diseased potatoes, there was no ability to know when a person entered the state whether or not they had COVID-19. While there was testing, the testing didn't necessarily pick up uh, when a person was first infected. Um, so uh, the High Court's jurisprudence on the diseased potatoes um, therefore didn't uh, really apply. Uh, the High Court then reconsidered the tests that should be applied to see whether a law breaches section 92. First, it looked at whether the law discriminated against interstate trade or movement. In this case, the law did by preventing the movement of people across the border. Second, it looked at whether there was a legitimate purpose for the law and whether it was proportionate to achieving that purpose. In this case, the High Court held that there was a legitimate purpose of protecting public health and that the law was proportionate to achieving it. There were inbuilt restrictions in the Western Australian law that provided its emergency powers. They could only be exercised for the purpose of managing the adverse effects of a declared emergency, and an emergency could only be declared where extraordinary measures were required to minimise loss of life and harm to health. If the powers were exercised for other purposes, such as political purposes, then their exercise would be invalid. But that was not the case here. Chief Justice Kiefel and Justice Keane said, it may be accepted that the restrictions are severe, but it cannot be denied that the importance of the protection of health and life amply justifies the severity of the measures. Now, while the terminology differed over the years, all the examples I have described lead to the same conclusion. Section 92 is not absolute. The interstate movement of people may be restricted, but only where there is a legitimate purpose, such as public health and safety, and only if the restriction is proportionate to achieving that legitimate purpose. This approach is also consistent with overseas authority. So if you look, for example, at the litigation in the United Kingdom about freedom of movement, etc., which relies on the European Convention of Human Rights, um, it still comes down to the same sort of analogy, uh, same sort of reasoning in relation to purpose and proportionality. But if the states could validly enact these laws, could those laws be overridden by the Commonwealth? Section 109 of the Constitution provides that where valid Commonwealth and state laws conflict, the Commonwealth law prevails and the state law is inoperative to the extent of the inconsistency. The High Court has also held that the Commonwealth may enact a law that covers a particular field to the exclusion of state law within that field. So could that have been done by the Commonwealth in a way that excluded the capacity of the states to um, close their borders? The Commonwealth, of course, can only legislate upon matters that fall within the heads of power that have been allocated to the Commonwealth. Now, one of those heads of power is the external affairs power. Remember that from the Tasmanian Dam case. It can be used to implement treaty obligations, including those in human rights treaties, such as the right to movement, uh, which you find in Article 12 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But Article 12 is expressly subject to a qualification that it may be restricted, as provided by law, where this is necessary to protect public health, amongst other things. And the UN Human Rights Committee, in interpreting that qualification, has stated that any restriction must be proportionate and the least intrusive way of achieving that particular purpose. Commonwealth legislation to give effect to this right of freedom of movement would probably uh, not have been capable of overriding state border closures if those state laws were regarded as necessary to protect public health and proportionate in their application. And this is because the Commonwealth's implementation of the treaty obligation would be regarded as only a partial implementation and inconsistent with the terms and intent of the provision, which does allow those types of qualifications where you're doing it to protect public health. And that may well be the reason why the Commonwealth didn't take this approach to try and override the states. 
Now, the Commonwealth, however, has another power, being the power to make laws with respect to quarantine. Now, this is a concurrent power, meaning both the Commonwealth and the states can make laws about quarantine. But if, as I said, there's an inconsistency between the laws, the Commonwealth law will be the one that prevails. In the past, for example, the Commonwealth did take over state quarantine centres. So that, that state quarantine station in North Head in, in New South Wales was uh, in the past taken over by the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth could have exercised the power to enact a comprehensive law with respect to quarantine of people suffering from diseases, which included the management of the movement of people carrying or potentially carrying a disease across state borders. Now, theoretically, this could have excluded the application of state laws that required permission to cross the state borders or required entrance to meet certain types of quarantine requirements. Although it would depend, of course, on how you actually drafted the law and whether or not it actually still fell within the head of power of quarantine. Theoretically, however, it could have been done. Now, the reason I say theoretically is because in practice, the implementation of such a comprehensive Commonwealth law was probably well beyond the capacity of the Commonwealth government to manage. Uh, and this, again, is probably why the Commonwealth did not pursue that course. It's not a lack of legal power but rather the absence of the actual physical capacity to give effect to such a law. How would the Commonwealth have had the facilities and the medical um, practitioners and the people and the logistics and everything in order to completely and comprehensively take over quarantine in the entire country? Uh, it had run down its quarantine facilities in the past. It had previously taken over the state ones, then it sold them all off or gave them back. The, the, the infrastructure wasn't there, and in practical terms, the Commonwealth couldn't do it. Uh, politically, there was greater benefit to the Commonwealth in carping about border closures than actually then being responsible for the consequences of opening up state borders if those consequences meant um, COVID racing through a state and thousands of people being dead. The Commonwealth government presumably didn't want to be the ones seen to be responsible for each of the funerals. Okay, so in conclusion, what does all this tell us? Well, the states can, in rare circumstances, restrict movement across state borders if it's for a legitimate purpose, such as protecting public health and the law is proportionate. Such a law can exclude everyone from the state premier himself, um, Henry Lefroy, or a wealthy businessman, such as Clive Palmer. But if there is not a clear justification for restricting interstate movement as opposed to intrastate movement, as was the case during the war, then a law that does so may be struck down so that lovelorn young women or Sydney gangland figures, as the case may be, may travel across the country with impunity. So Love may have laughed at rail permits, but so did Dulcie, who seemed to be much better able to get into Western Australia than either Henry or Clive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm going to have to um, find an opportunity to work that line. Uh, the High Court's jurisprudence on diseased potatoes did not apply into some advice that I uh, need to prepare in the future. One, one of the, the areas in which um, uh, we had an interest in uh, border closures and, and public health measures during um, the first two years of the pandemic was in relation to public health measures um, that restricted the movement of politicians mm. in and out of uh, in and out of, of the ACT, um, and we found that most of the public health measures had um, some some sort of exemption or ability to um, enable permits to be um, uh, granted to FIFO workers, fly in, fly out workers, and we may have relied on that a little bit to. Uh, <laughs> To, to, get, uh, to, to keep the parliament uh, operating over the last two years. Uh, we do have some time for questions, um, and I know that uh, uh, people love to ask questions after these lectures, and we have a couple of microphones here, so I will invite uh, 
invite uh, you, sir, to join us here. And uh, I think the microphones, are, if you'd yeah, rather be up here. Either. I think this is a great place. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for a very interesting, informative talk, Professor Toomey. Do you think that as a result of what you've told us, the law can be regarded as fairly settled in Australia, and that if we have another outbreak, uh, such as uh, COVID, that the ground rules, the understanding between the Commonwealth and the states is fairly clear, or do you think there's room for a lot more debate? Uh, I think there is room for more debate. I mean, I have to say, although the, the, the description I gave of the case was um, fairly um, innocuous here, I, I, I have some concerns with the way the High Court decided the Palmer case. I have some concerns with their reasoning, and I think there are particular problems in relation to issues of timing. Um, so one of the odd things about the, the Palmer litigation is because they referred it off to the Justice Rangia, there was actually a reasonable amount of time before when, between when the case was initiated and when it was actually resolved. And during that period of time, you know, if you if you were looking at the justification for closing the border, it changed radically because I kept on being asked by this by the media all the time, right? And, I, and it, so sometimes it would be the case where there was, you know, a huge wave of COVID going through and it was clearly obvious that you really needed the Western Australian border, you know, shut and it was justifiable in those circumstances. And there were other times where most of the country had no COVID at all. And then it was much harder to justify. And because it sort of had this sort of swinging thing going on there, it raises really interesting and difficult questions about, um, uh, you know, how do you decide? Is it just simply at the point where the, the, the regulation was made? If you're reliant on proportionality, that proportionality changes as the facts change. And so how do you manage that? You know, if it's justified at this point, and it's not justified at that point of time, but then it's justified here and it's proportionate, how do you deal with that? Now, that was all ducked in the Palmer case. So if the question is, is there still a lot of stuff we don't know and um, how would it play out in the future? The answer is there is still a lot of stuff we don't know and it might play out differently in the future if the, if the court were presented with these things in a, in a different way. So yeah, I think there is still a lot to learn. But you know, in practical terms, we learned a lot about human nature as well. And that is that, um, and probably rightly so, politicians in the end will want to protect their own people. They're the people who elect them. They're the people that they're responsible to. And, you know, in the end, they take that responsibility, you know, seriously, and they will make efforts to protect them. And so you can have all the arrangements and intergovernmental agreements, et cetera, in advance in the world. But when the crisis strikes, people will tr do their best to act in the interests of the people who elect them. Okay, next question. Thank you very much for that interesting uh, lecture. Uh, here we are in the Australian Capital Territory. Does everything you've said about Section 92 jurisprudence translate straightforwardly to the borders between the ACT and the Northern Territory, mm. respectively, with the states? Or is there some other complexity arising from Section 122 or um, yes, the special status of the territories? Yeah, so it is complex. So. Um, uh, Section 92 doesn't apply um, in relation to movement between the states and the ACT, but when the self-government legislation was created for the ACT, um, I think also for the Northern Territory, not absolutely sure, uh, they put a provision in there that was the equivalent of Section 92. So there is a... Um, uh, a sort of a pretend version of Section 92, but it's legislative in nature rather than um, a constitutional provision. Uh, the High Court has interpreted it in the same way as it does with the, with the Commonwealth one. But you've also got, of course, the, the, the possibility because of Section 122 that the Commonwealth Parliament can override as well. Um, so coming back to the problem about the, the, the MPs coming to um, Canberra, etc. Um, from the ACT side, if the Commonwealth Parliament had wanted to do so, it certainly could have taken action to override any restrictions that the ACT Parliament, um, a Legislative Assembly, was imposing. So you've got a lot of factors at play there. You could change the ACT self-government legislation if you wanted to at the Commonwealth level. Um, you can legislate to override. So it's not the same. It is more complex. Um, it's what goes to make Canberra and the ACT a very interesting place constitutionally. <laughs>
Thank you very much for an interesting talk, Professor Toomey. I have a question about the inclusion of the term absolutely free in uh, the section in the relevant provision, yep. 92. I was going to say 52, definitely not the right one. Um, if the drafters seem to contemplate some restrictions, as other provisions suggest, is there anything in the um, you know, discussions or... Yeah, why did they say yeah. that they didn't mean it? Yeah. yeah. Good question. Um, so the answer to that is, um, uh, well, it's often said, um, one of the politicians described it as, quote, I think it was George Reid, a little bit of layman's language. And so he actually praised Section 92 by saying, instead of using all that finickety lawyery language where you're really precise about all these things, we've used a little bit of layman's language. Absolutely free, isn't that marvellous? And then of course, by not using the finickety lawyer language, it's caused grief ever since. Um, so while people hate lawyers and their finickety language and being very precise, um, the answer is it's a good thing to do sometimes when you're setting out rules because you do want to be more precise. So that, that's part of the answer. Uh, the other answer, I, part of the answer is that there was a, um, uh, the people who wrote the constitution sort of knew amongst themselves what they were intending to do and it's a lot harder for us to read that now, but they were less worried about some of the terminology they used because they all knew and they were all sort of chaps in the one club and everybody was going to be behaving in a, in a particular way that they, the, the way they thought the system was going to work. And that lasted for 20 years. But once they died out um, and um, uh, instead of it being a political compact and the lawyers then t treated it as a legal document, that all got thrown out the window in, in 1920 with the engineers case. Um, so again, it comes down to you've really got to be careful when you do with the constitution to write what you mean um, and not just to think, oh, well, we all understand what it means and that's how everybody's going to apply it in the future. So there's a lesson for all constitutional amendments. Thank you very much. Um, from memory, there seem to be quite a number of medical emergencies in New South Wales on the New South Wales Queensland border. And the healthcare system is funded by the states and the Commonwealth government. Um, and at one stage, the Queensland Premier turned around and said, well, Queensland hospitals are for Queenslanders and not Australians. Um, I was wondering if that was legal under the medical um, agreements between the Commonwealth and the states, because if the Commonwealth's providing funding for all Australians and there are all yeah. these people on that border seeking medical emergencies and they were being airlifted miles and miles out of the way. There was a case where there was a lady with twins and she lost one of the twins. Um, it just, I just wondered if that was constitutional under the healthcare agreements. Um, well, the answer to that is I don't know because I haven't looked at you know the, the legislation or the rules or conditions of the, of the healthcare agreements. Um, it did strike me as appalling um, at the time and um, you know, while there may be very good reasons for stopping people, you know, bringing COVID into the state and all the rest of it, there there really aren't good reasons for behaving in a way that um, actually creates immediate health problems, you know, in order to stop potential health problems. So um, I, I agree with you. I think some of the behaviour in terms of um, stopping people um, crossing borders for medical reasons was dreadful. Um, I think some of it was resolved over time. I mean, I, I, you know, initially sort of stronger actions were taken and then people became more reasonable over time and there were exceptions, et cetera, provided. So possibly it was a consequence of um, the pressure of the time and emergencies and when people became a bit more rational or had time to think it through, they found other ways of achieving, you know, the same outcomes in, uh, in a more sensible way. Um, but in terms of, it, of one of the questions earlier about, you know, what have we learned and what do we need to do? I think that dealing with border communities in these types of um, crises in the future, I think a lot of work needs to be done about how you can manage these things in a way that d doesn't actually cause problems so that, you know, prevents bad things from happening, but doesn't have the flip side of making, you know, potentially worse things happen. So um, border communities and how to manage that um, is definitely something that a lot more work needs to be done on because I don't think that was handled very well. Thanks so much. We'll leave it. We'll leave it there. Um, can I thank all of you for coming along uh, today to
our um, annual, hopefully again, it will be our annual Harry Evans uh, lecture. This is our final event for 2022. Um, a recording of this lecture will be um, online on the, the uh, Senate website shortly, as well as information about next year's uh, lecture series. If you're not already subscribed, you've got to ask people to subscribe to things these days. Um, there is an email subscription uh, that you can sign up to on your way out if you'd like to uh, be kept up to date with information about the, the, the series. That concludes our formal proceedings here today. It just remains for me to ask you to join me once again in thanking uh, Professor Toomey for her talk today. Thank you so much. And thank you.